will be talking about some preliminary results that uh, we have for this study um, that I'm working on with Ron Burton and Ricardo Ferreira uh, on the importance of mitonuclear versus nuclear nuclear hybrid compatibility in a species without sex chromosomes. Uh, so these incompatibilities lead to intrinsic postergotic isolation. So these happen when a population gets split up in two and gene flow stops um, or it becomes very low to the point that the populations can then diverge and given enough time, if they ever come back together and mate, their offspring um, has problems and is either sterile or inviolable. So this sterility and viability is usually caused by these Bates and Dobzhensky Miller incompatibilities or Dobzhensky Miller incompatibilities. And these are epistatic interactions between two or more loci. So in this case, here's the example we have uh, the ancestral lowercase uh, uh, little a and little b alleles. In one of the populations, the big A allele um, evolves. In the other one, the big B allele evolves. And these derived alleles work well with any of the ancestral uh, uh, genomes. For some reason, uh, selection or genetic drift, these go to fixation. And if the populations ever come back together and mate, uh, the big A allele and the big B allele have never been tested in the same genetic background together and it can lead to sterility or inviability. Many times these incompatibilities are partially recessive, so you don't observe them in the F1 and heterozygous, but you do in later generation hybrids when you make them both homozygous or um, in back process where at least one of them is homozygous. <coughs> um, so how they rule is a pattern that further describes uh, what intrinsic postergotic isolation causes, and this is the case where in the F1 hybrid, um, <coughs> If one of the sexes is rare, absent, or sterile, this sex is the heterogametic sex. So the heterogametic sex would be male, XY um, sex chromosomes in uh, mammals and flies, or females in birds and butterflies. Okay. So as you can see, you know this rule implies that you the uh, taxa have sex chromosomes, which is not always the case. Okay, so there's a whole continuum of sex chromosome evolution where. You have some species that don't have sex chromosomes, and sex is determined by multiple genes in different chromosomes or by the environment, and then you evolve young sex chromosomes that are very similar to each other, so they're homomorphic. And you go all the way to um, the very heteromorphic sex chromosomes, okay? And for the next uh, couple of slides, I'm gonna consider this whole middle part as homomorphic sex chromosomes, this is heteromorphic sex chromosomes. So how does this affect the strength of how things rule? So here in this figure on the x-axis, you have the strength of intrinsic postergotic isolation. So if it's a one, it means that in the reciprocal process, males and females are completely sterile or inviolable. Zero, the F1 hybrids are fine, and you increase by 0.25, okay? On the x-axis, you have genetic uh, distance between the sex that they're hybridizing, and each one of these points is a cross, and there are crosses here uh, for different vertebrate, invertebrate, and plant um, sex, okay? In black, you have the heterogametic sex. In green, you have the homogametic sex. On the top, you have the heteromorphic sex chromosome class, and in the bottom, the homomorphic sex chromosome class. So what you can see is that how the rule is stronger when you have more heteromorphic sex chromosomes, you see the lines are further apart here, and then homomorphic sex chromosomes, the lines come together. Okay, so by this idea, you would expect that if you don't have any sex chromosomes, then there should be no difference between the two sexes in the F1 hybrid, okay? And this is what we see in the Tegriopus californicus, which is a copepod that does not have sex chromosomes, so sex is determined by polygenic, so several genes um, in different chromosomes. And there is no difference, wow, it's a weird figure. No difference between males and females in the F1 hybrid, uh, but we do have different clades, and the figure is all weird here. So there are southern clade in Baja here, uh, intermediate clade, and then a northern clade from California all the way to Alaska. And if you cross these different clades, you get different patterns of reproductive isolation. And if you notice, uh, what matters here is not really the sex, if you're male or female as an F1 hybrid, but the direction of the cross, okay? So if you cross this northern clade with the southern clade in one direction, 
uh, hybrids are sterile, in the other one, hybrids are inviolable, both males and females. Southern and intermediate in one direction of the cross, the hybrids are inviolable in the other direction, they're fine, and you can get F2 and F3 hybrids, okay? So this suggests that maybe if you don't have sex chromosomes, mitonuclear incompatibility or other forms of uniparentally inherited factors are actually important for uh, giving rise to F1 um, hybrid sterility or inviability, okay? So just to introduce the system a little bit, so these copepods in inhabit flesh pools, um, and you find them from Baja, Mexico, all the way to Alaska. The populations are very segregated, and there is a lot of genetic diverse, uh, divergence between very closely related, uh, geographically closely related populations, and we, this is a tree for um, mitochondrial DNA, and you see that you get um, divergence as high as 20% for populations that are not too, too far away from each other. And in this talk, I'm gonna focus on a cross between the San Diego population and Santa Cruz population. It's about 20% divergence in mitochondrial DNA, and uh, synonymous substitution rate is about 6% for these guys. So what is the pattern of uh, evidence for mitonuclear incompatibility after the F1 hybrid stage? So for these, these are both in that northern place. So when you cross them, the F1 hybrid has higher fitness than the parents. And this is true for survivorship, for fecundity, and for a few other measurements of fitness. But when you get to the F2 and F3 hybrid, then the fitness decreases, okay? So you get hybrid breakdown. And then if you back cross, uh, the F3 hybrid either to the maternal or the paternal, so matching or not matching the mitochondria, uh, you can rescue fitness if you match the mitochondria. So again, suggesting that these mitonuclear incompatibilities are important for these guys, okay? Uh, the issue here is, both in the F1 case that I showed and here, uh, you're not recreating the double homozygous um, genotypes that would expose nuclear nuclear incompatibility, right? So when you back cross, it's just one class of homozygous. So we were interested in uh, looking at the importance of these two kinds of incompatibilities when you do recreate these homozygous homozygous um, uh, genotypes that could lead to exposing uh, nuclear nuclear incompatibilities. And the way we did this, we cross uh, the two populations, get F1 hybrids, cross them, get F2 hybrids, and then we split them up into multiple replicates, okay? And we let these replicates go for nine months, all right? After nine months, we measured three fitness traits. Two of them were associated with viability and the other one was fecundity. And then we chose three replicates for each one of the reciprocal crosses that had the highest fitness recovery for all of these three measurements, all right? And then we sequenced pools of individuals, about 300 individuals per replicate. So what are the expectations for this? So if, you know, nuclear-nuclear incompatibilities are very important, the two reciprocal crosses would be similar to each other, right? Because the only thing that differs is the mitochondria. In the other hand, if mitonuclear incompatibilities are important, then the reciprocal crosses should be very different. And we should tend to see a larger part of the genome with allele frequency skewed from the expected 50-50 towards the alleles of the population that matches the mitochondria, all right? Okay, so here we have the results on the x-axis. We have the 12 chromosomes in copepods. This is a Manhattan plot, so in the Y chromosome is a negative log 10 of the p-value. Each one of these dots is a SNP, so if you're high on the Y chromosome or Y axis, it means that allele frequencies are skewed away from the 50-50 uh, ratio in all three replicates, okay? The, more, the higher you are, the more skewed these are. And then the blue dots, it means there's an excess of Santa Cruz alleles, red dots, there's an excess of San Diego alleles. And the units that we consider is not the SNP itself, but these groups of SNPs that form peaks, okay? And then what you can see here is that, uh, first of all, in both, pro in both reciprocals, um, the top one is the San Diego mitochondria, the bottom one is Santa Cruz mitochondria, there is a lot more blue dots 